On April 15th in 1912, the Titanic sank. We've all heard about that. It's been something that has certainly made an impression upon uh, so many people as we heard about what took place at that time. There had been iceberg warnings on the radio uh, through much of the trip as the Titanic had set out from uh, England. And on the night, or the fourth night of their maiden journey, um, they had heard other warnings that particular night as they were heading out. At 9.40, the Masaba, another ship, had said that there, were, uh, there was an ice field, and there were ice warnings that were out there, other warnings this, regarding the dangers that had been out there. Um, another ship had stopped the Californian because it said that it was completely surrounded by ice. And however, the radio operator on the Titanic scolded them because the radio operator was in the middle of sending messages in behalf of the, of the uh, people that were on board just back you know, to this, their friends, whatever it was. So he scolded the California for interrupting when the California said they were completely surrounded for ice and had stopped in the water because of the particular danger. At 11.40, the lookouts on the top of the Titanic saw the ice, gave the warning, and the first officer gave the order to turn sharply to the left and to slow down, put the engines in reverse, but it was too late. And two hours and 20 minutes later, the ship sank. And with that was the loss of 1,514 lives. They had received six warnings over time, but they had kept going ahead anyway. It was a great tragedy. In our text that we're looking at this morning, the Apostle Paul speaks about shipwreck. The Apostle Paul knew a thing or two about shipwreck. If you look in Acts chapter 27, the whole chapter describes Paul's journey and about how they were heading out and they had difficulty on the way and they stopped and, and then how they decided to set out. And in verses 9 through 12, Paul gives warning and says, I perceive that if you go on, this is going to end up in much loss of much loss if you continue. But the centurion that had Paul uh, talked with others and the basic vote was, oh, let's go on anyway. And so they did. You know what the outcome was by the end of Acts chapter 27, um, they were in shipwrecked. So therefore in 1 Timothy chapter one, when Paul gives warning about possible shipwreck, I would suggest that it's probably wise to take heed to his warning. Paul knows a thing or two about shipwreck. He uses that particular figure of speech, that spiritual shipwreck, but he uses it in a very intentional way because there's a calamity that could await those that don't heed his warning. The passage that we're going to be looking at today is 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. In these particular verses, the challenge that I would share with you today is that the shepherd and the sheep must focus on God's grace and inner heart transformation to avoid shipwreck. God's shepherd and God's sheep must focus on God's grace and inner heart transformation to avoid shipwreck. Now, as we look at these verses, I would ask the first question of what is the nature of the charge that Paul's bringing? And to answer that, we'll look at verse 18. Verse 18, Paul gives his charge to Timothy. I'm going to read verses 18 through 20, but then we'll come back to verse 18 specifically. In verse 18, Paul writes, This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you might fight the good fight, keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. If you look at those words, very short paragraph, three verses here, you can see Paul's challenge that he makes to Timothy the focus that he says Timothy should be making in verse 19. And then he says, here's the, here's the consequences. If you don't watch out for this sort of an emphasis, Timothy, uh, it can lead to spiritual shipwreck. As we look at these verses then, the question is, what is the nature of Paul's charge? 
And Paul's charge, I would say, is driven by both command and commissioning. By command, Paul, as the commander, is saying to Timothy, Timothy, this is what you need to do. But he also references, references Paul, uh, Timothy's commissioning and the fact that he has been set apart by God, it's been recognized by others, and so he has a, a responsibility to God as far as what he is doing as a shepherd of the people there in Ephesus. So as we look here at these verses, in verse 18, Paul says, I command, I entrust to you. This command, I entrust to you. The word that's translated as command has the idea of an urgent, obligation to a commander in chief. Now if you, I don't know if any of you have served in the military before, I haven't, I can't claim the experience, I haven't been there. However, from what we hear and observe and know of those that do, you don't dishonor and you don't disobey those commands that are handed down from whoever it is that happens to come up above in authority in leadership for your division, your platoon, your, your orders, whatever they are, you don't disobey those. Paul uses a military word here to try to emphasize this is important, Timothy, if that could just give heightened importance. Now, as we look at the nature of the problem and you realize the words that Paul is using, Paul means this seriously. This is significant, Timothy. And I'm commanding you, I'm giving you this, and I'm entrusting it to you. The entrustment of verse 18 ties in with Timothy's commissioning when he was commissioned. In verse one, verse, chapter 1, verse 12, Paul, Paul wrote, talking about himself, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. In verse 12, Paul references his commissioning by God. God, in spite of what he was, talks about that in the next verses, Paul says, God put me into service. This is the same kind of reference that Paul is making to Timothy with respect to his service for the Lord. God's the one that put him there. And this is to give a divine unction, a divi it's a divine emphasis to it. Paul's saying, you are filling this responsibility because God put you there, Timothy. He says, I'm commanding you, and you're there in that role because God chose to put you there, and I'm entrusting this. This should definitely be making Timothy realize this is important. This is an urgent, this is not just, hey, Paul say, hey, I think this might be a good idea for you to try this. It's not like that. This is coming at a much greater sense of urgency. And then if you look at the at the end of verse 18, it says that by them you might fight the good fight. And the good fight, by the way, is sort of, it, it doesn't have an antecedent that's close by by which we can understand what the fight is. But it refers back to what Paul's charge had been to Timothy beginning in verse 3 and on down through verse 4 and verse 5. In verse 3, Paul says, I urge you upon my departure to instruct men not to teach strained doctrines. Verse 4, and not to pay attention to, and he gives the example there. And then verse 5, and he says, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart, good conscience, and a sincere faith. And so Paul says, this is what our focus and emphasis had been. And for Paul to now talk about fighting a good fight, He's referenced in the fact that what we've commissioned and given to you is the good thing. It's God ordained. This is of God for you to focus on. And then Paul gave the contrast in verses 6 and following. He said, some men have strayed from these things. And as Paul goes on and talks about the law, how the law is good if you use it lawfully, the implication here is that people have put a wrong, the false teachers have put a wrong emphasis upon the law. In contrast to verse 5, love, good conscience, sincere faith. In other words, their focus has been on the external listings of what was given by Moses. And instead, Paul is saying their focus was wrong. 
of these, these teachers. They're putting the wrong emphasis. Instead, it needs to be something that's internal. And Paul even goes on and he says in the next paragraph, he talks about God's grace worked in me and that I was the worst of all sinners and God saved me and he put me in the position of responsibility. The focus that Paul's making is on God's grace, God's grace in my life. And we want to teach that it's the heart, it's the love, it's the faith, it's that transformed life, the desire for having a clear conscience before God not just an outside externality, but instead something that's internalized and made a part of you. And Paul is saying this is where the focus would be. And he's saying here in the end of verse 18, Timothy, I command you that this is in keeping with your responsibility before God. God has put you in this position. And as you have this position, this is how you fight the good fight. Paul is putting a lot of emphasis here in verse 18 on the fact that this is a charge that is driven by command and also by commissioning. The commissioning I'd like to take a little bit further. Uh, Timothy had been given a responsibility, has been charged, has been tasked with uh, his pastoral responsibility. And if we look over in uh, chapter 4, verse 14 of 1 Timothy, Paul in chapter 4, verse 14 says, Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. And Paul is making reference to the fact that when Timothy was ordained, when he was commissioned, when he started off his ministry, that there were some that prophesied about him, that preached or had a insight from God regarding the nature of Timothy's ministry. Uh, a parallel to this could be in Acts chapter 13, verse 2, where there were some that understood that Paul and Barnabas's, Barnabas's ministry was definitely of God. In Acts chapter 13, verse 2, I'll read verses 1 and 2. Now there were at Antioch and the church that was there prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and uh, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod, and the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. When they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Now, if you look in chap here in Acts 13, 1 through 3, there is very evidence, there's very clear evidence that God was ordaining Paul and sending him out and through the utterances of others, their understanding as the Holy Spirit led, Paul was commissioned. Paul now seems to be in 1 Timothy saying to him, you, had, you were set apart through the words that were given to others regarding your ministry. And Paul is saying, you have a special place and responsibility. God has given you this responsibility. This is not just something that's to be taken lightly. And so in verse 18 of 1 Timothy 1, Paul is emphasizing both his command, marching orders for Timothy, and secondly, Timothy's commissioning and tied in with that. But then we also have to consider what is supposed to be the essential focus. On the one hand, we've looked here in verse 18 and we've seen that uh, Paul's charge was driven by command and commissioning. Going on to verse 19, we ask, what is to be the essential focus? For verse 18, we asked, what is the nature of the charge? Now for verse 19, we'll ask, what is to be the essential focus? And Paul's charge is to bring Timothy to focus on the inner heart and transformation. Look at how Paul, he says, now, you do this, you fight a good fight. This is where the focus ought to be, Timothy 19, keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. So in verse 19, Paul is saying faith and good conscience. Going back to the whole chapter, faith and good conscience is a reflection on what he had said back in verse 5. Back in verse 5, he says, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So in verse 19, Paul is going back to what he had said before. 
And all of this is in contrast to the false teaching of those people that had emphasized the law in a wrong way. So Paul says the interest is in the context. Well, we have to look at the, in, the, look at the context as we look at this here. It's in the context, verse 5, of love, of faith, of conduct. It's also in the contrast contrasting emphasis on the wrong teaching of the law in verses 8 to 11. In verse 8 to 11, Paul says, we know the law is good if you use it lawfully, but the purpose of the law is to bring conviction upon those that are lawbreakers, those that are sinners. It brings conviction. And Paul, a number of weeks ago, we looked at this passage, and Paul said, it's by the law I know sin. I wouldn't know covetousness was wrong unless the law had said so. That's the purpose of the law. And so, there's a reason for that. It's to bring immoral men and, and wicked people to realize their shortcoming before God, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God. And then after we looked at law, Paul went right from that to talking about God's grace. Verses, in, in, in those next verses, Paul said in verses 12 to 14, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord because of what he has done. Even though I was a persecutor and aggressor, I was shown mercy, verse 14, and the grace of our Lord was more abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. And look there in, in verse 14, faith and love cropping up again in the context of grace. Paul says, God's grace. And Paul is pre has presented here in 1 Timothy chapter 1 a contrast between what Timothy should emphasize as the proper shepherd and pastor of the church versus the wrong teaching that was out there, and he's giving Timothy the charge saying, those people that are teaching wrong regarding laws and lists and all these externals, he says, those that are emphasizing the externalities of observing the law are missing the point with regard to the inner heart and faith and transformation and good conscience on the inside. It's God's grace that's worked in my heart that made me, who was a persecutor, into having the response that I've had. God's grace worked in me. And the emphasis has to be love that's transforming, faith that shows belief in God, a good conscience before God, which takes it from knowledge to behavior. The good conscience is that we know what God expects of us. We then choose to yield ourselves as instruments to righteousness rather than to evil and wickedness, as Romans 6 and 7 talk about. And we yield ourselves and then we have a good conscience before God because we've yielded ourselves to righteousness. Paul says this is where your obedience shows itself in your life. You have faith in God, you trust in God. It's God's grace that does the transformation. But then the obedience shows itself as you have a good conscience before God because you're, you've done from the heart, on the inside, what God expected from you. So Paul, it makes, this is the context then for what Paul says in verses 19 and 20. Keep faith and a good conscience. And this is exactly what Hymenaeus and Alexander dropped the ball on. Uh, they dropped it. He says, and the consequence was shipwreck in regard to their faith. Now I want you to think, if you would please, about the implications for this and for today. We don't have the same people emphasizing the same things that Paul did and, and that, uh, as Hymenaeus and Alexander did back in that day. However, there are dangers today of any kind of list-based standard of acceptability to God. When there's an external, whether it be written or unwritten, in a group, church, whatever, denomination, whatever it might happen to be, based on you do all these things and you have a right standing before God. When it is merely external without dealing with the heart, the love, the transformation, the faith, the good conscience, when it's just on the external side, there's a problem. And that's what Paul is hitting in a major way in 1 Timothy chapter 1, saying these people have taught the wrong thing and it leads to shipwreck. We, I shared about the Titanic. That was pretty bad news. That was awful. It had so many people whose lives were lost. And it would appear that if they had altered their course and done things differently, it might have been avoidable. I mean, only God knows that. We can't predict, we can't presume on that. However, there were warnings given that were not heeded. And Paul is here saying to Timothy, these are warnings. 
And if you don't heed these warnings, shipwreck lies ahead. And I would suggest that within modern Christianity, when the warnings of 1 Timothy 1 have not been heeded by those in pastoral leadership positions in churches and groups, the consequence can be shipwreck in terms of where it ends up. It's also a problem when it's just ex something external. External, at least in the context of 1 Timothy 1, external to the heart, external to grace, external to love, external to faith, external to good conscience. That's what Paul's saying we must have. In other words, it's your heart on the inside that must be right before God. Not whether or not on the outside you happen to dot your I's and cross your T's the way someone says that maybe you should or ought to, to be accepted or to be looked up to in a church, a body, or anything else. It's not just the externals. Now, on the inside, if one does have the faith, a good conscience, it will show on the outside. But it has to be an inside motivated outside show in terms of where a person happens to be. It's not just the outside, where the inside could be, as Christ said to the Pharisees, on the outside, you're beautiful, but you're like whitewashed sepulchers, because the inside is like full of dead men's bones. And a person today could, on the outside, put on a nice show and be whitewashed and pretty and beautiful, but on the inside could have a heart that's harboring all sorts of things that are absolutely violently contrary to what things of God would be. Paul says, get with the faith, good conscience. It's inside. That will work itself out. But that's where the focus must be as he's teaching Timothy in this passage. But then we go on and we have to say, what is the danger of not making this focus? And Paul emphasizes that at the end of verse 19 and 20. End of 19, it is shipwreck. We've already talked about that. But then he says, among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander. And I would point out that not only is it shipwreck, but Paul is citing specific examples. You know, if you can give a specific example, it sometimes helps people to understand what your point happens to be. Um, for public speaking, it's one thing to say, well, everybody does this. Everybody does that. And this happens to everybody. And when you speak in generalities like everybody and all and all that, it's just, yeah, you hear me. But if I can say it happened to this person and this was the consequence of what happened to him in his life or her life, the specifics all of a sudden bring it home, meaning this is real. This happens to a real person that I know or know about. And when Paul cites Hymenaeus and Alexander, those are real, verifiable people that if the people of Ephesus didn't know, they at least could have done some background checking and probably found out about them and what was going on with them. And so Paul is using a specific to say, this is real. Timothy, this matters. And here are two examples of people that dropped the ball and now they've suffered shipwreck. So the specificity of Paul's examples give emphasis to the point that Paul's saying this has nothing to be trifled with. And then if you look at the last part of verse 20, Paul talks about now what he's, going, he's, he's had to do. I handed them over to Satan so they will be taught not to blaspheme. Just think about that for a minute. I mean, it's one thing to get your finger slapped if you, if you do something wrong. Well, Paul's basically saying, I'm turning these over to Satan to teach these, couple, these guys a lesson or two. On the one hand, notice the fact that this is a significant sentence or action on Paul's part. Paul's not messing around. Delivering someone over to Satan, but notice that there's a restorative purpose in it. It's not delivered over like they're hopeless, they're gone, they're sh they're. They're out of the picture completely. Paul says, I've delivered them to Satan, so they will be taught not to blaspheme. Now we think of blasphemy in terms of taking the Lord's name in vain, or maybe saying something that's doctrinally incorrect. Paul's using the word blaspheme here in a broader picture. He's saying that their wrong teaching is blasphemous, it was wrong. Their emphasis, whatever it was, on the law in some wrong way, was blasphemous. It was taking away from God, taking away from God's glory. 
maybe taken away from God's glory in terms of his grace and what he does, his transformation, what he does in a person's life by his power, by the Holy Spirit. But Paul says, I've delivered these two over to Satan that they can learn not to blaspheme. I would suggest that Paul's point is when he talks about shipwreck, delivery to Satan, Paul's saying, this is high caliber stuff. This is important stuff. This is not something just to be taken lightly. And when we consider today how easy it can be for churches, groups, or bodies of believers to imagine that, well, these are some unwritten characteristics of a spiritual person will do this, that, or whatever. Oh, this is our, these are our standards, whatever it is. It's awfully easy for a person to conform to the external while their heart can be far, far away from where it needs to be. And Paul says when your emphasis is on the externals, it's going to lead to shipwreck in your life. It has to be in the inside. That's why our emphasis, verse 5, is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, a sincere, unhypocritical faith. Verse 19, keeping faith and a good conscience. This is where the focus needs to be. So my challenge for you today is, as we look at God's word, we must focus on God's grace and inner heart transformation to avoid shipwreck, both for our own lives, not just on the outward show, not just on the outside what it might look like to others that come and see you on Sunday, not to just on the outside to what coworkers, friends, or family members or Christians might see, or others that might see you, but it's on the inside, in the heart. That's where Paul is putting the emphasis, saying, Timothy, this is where your focus has to be. And that's a challenge for both shepherd and sheep. Timothy is the shepherd, all of us as sheep, looking to Christ as the great shepherd over us all. Paul knew a thing or two about shipwreck. He'd been there. Acts 27 describes the shipwreck that came about when Paul's warning was not heeded. When Paul gives a warning here about what will happen if you don't listen, I think we'd be wise to listen to Paul's advice here so that we don't suffer the same consequence. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne, I pray for your mercy and I pray for your grace. Heavenly Father, no one can stand upright before you. No one is perfect. Every one of us stand and recognize our own sin, even as we come before your throne. And Father, we acknowledge that. We need your grace. We need your mercy. And I pray, Father, that you will help each of us that are here and that might be listening over the internet I pray that you'll help each one of us to come before your throne and recognize our need for your grace and give praise and thanks to you for that forgiveness. Paul said, if God's grace was sufficient for me, I'm the worst of all. I should be an example to everybody else. May we all recognize that your grace is sufficient for everyone, no matter where they're coming from, no matter where they are today no matter how they might reflect on their past failures as a Christian or how they've been, had the wrong emphasis in terms of list or other external standards, Lord, may we all come with a desire to have a sincere, unhypocritical faith that's pure, washed by the blood of the Lamb as we come before your throne. May our faith, may our conscience be pure. May we be led by and shown your love that we in turn might love others as we might recognize we have been loved and accepted by you. And Lord, may we be guided by this. As Christ said to his disciples, they will know by your love. They'll recognize you as being my follower. Lord, may we be the same today, changed and transformed on the inside with hearts that are yielded to you, coming afresh to you for forgiveness when we sin and being restored because of the righteousness of Christ that's imputed to us. Lord, we thank you and praise you for what we have through your Son. May we focus upon that which matters with a pure heart. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.